Well, if you'll turn with me in the book of Jonah, chapter 2, I'm going to read uh, all of, uh, well, from verse 2 on in chapter 2, um, although the part I'm preaching on is only the last three verses. So for context, I'm going to read the entire, uh, all of Jonah's prayer. So Jonah 2, verse 2. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up, brought up my life from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Thus for the reading of the word. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to behold the wonderful things in your law. We pray that you would use this time to sanctify each of us, to make us more holy, to make us more like Christ. We pray that you would sink your word deep into our beings. And we pray that we would do, do this all in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing in the sermon series on uh, the book of Jonah. This is the seventh one by my count that we've done. And with it, we will be halfway through the book. We looked first at the historical and geographical context of Jonah. And since then, we've seen Jonah as an unfaithful prophet trying to run from God. We've seen Jonah as a sleeping prophet asleep in the bottom of the boat while the storm around him is raging. And we've also seen Jonah as the unloving prophet. He did not love the sailors whose lives he was putting in jeopardy by his unfaithfulness. And he did not love the Ninevites enough to preach repentance to them, even though God explicitly told him to do so. Jonah is a good metaphor for the modern church, as has been pointed out several times. The church has been unfaithful to her Lord, to her members, and to the culture at large. For at least the last hundred years, probably more. The church has fallen for the higher criticism that came out of Germany 150 years ago, questioning every aspect of scripture. For much of the last 150 years, in addition, the church has been more interested in getting out of the world than foreseeing the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, as it says in Revelation and as Handel quoted in the Messiah. The church has believed in relative truth, which has led to the unspeakable horrors of abortion, the sexual revolution, and now of the LGBTQ movement. Like Jonah, the church has been unfaithful and has been also asleep in the belly of the boat, asleep at the switch, as it were. And because of this unfaithfulness, the church has been unloving. The church won't call its members to repentance. How can it call the culture at large? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Here's a short prophetic book about a guy who was swallowed by a fish, and it's just as applicable to us now as it was to him 2,800 years ago. So let's look at the text. Verses 8 and 9 for today are the end of Jonah's prayer, which Daniel talked about last week. And he prayed this while he was in the belly of the fish. Along with the rest of chapter 2, the entire prayer is a kind of psalm. Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving has similar elements to many of the psalms. Jonah first appeals to God for help. In chapter 2, verse 2, he states, I cried out to the Lord. In Psalm 40, the psalm that we just sang, verse 1 says, I waited for the Lord. He stooped and heard my cry. 
There is the description of distress. Jonah 2, verse 3 says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. In Psalm 40, the distress comes later. We didn't sing it this morning, but verse 12 says, Innumerable evils have surrounded me. There is the despair of being sent to the netherworld, to the place of the dead. Both Jonah and David in Psalm 40 declare that they were in the pit or in Sheol. But God answers both Jonah and David by bringing them up from that pit. He also answers Jonah by having the fish vomit him out onto the dry land. In David's case, in Psalm 40, God answers David by hearing him and confounding his enemies. Finally, the prayer of Jonah is similar to Psalm 40 in that Jonah vows to praise God with sacrifices and vows of thanksgiving. David vows to proclaim God's good news to the right of righteousness to the great assembly. Jonah's prayer, therefore, can be thought of as a psalm, a song and a prayer of praise to God. And we know that there's a psalm book with 150 named psalms, or not named, but numbered psalms, that are specifically labeled that. But there are also other psalms scattered throughout Scripture. There's the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. There's the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. And the Magnificat of Mary in Luke 1. And it seems, although it seems as though Jonah composed this psalm while in the belly of the fish, but it also is certain that he was familiar with the Psalms of David. He was familiar with the Psalms of David so that some of the themes of the Psalms came to him in the time of his distress. This shows the beneficial effects of knowing the Psalms. That's why we sing them. We sing them to praise God, but we also sing them to learn them. Turns out that singing helps you memorize things. And we don't just sing the 150 psalms exclusively because there are other psalms like this one scattered throughout Scripture. But knowing the psalms is of inestimable help during the time of distress. Knowing how to appeal to God, how to appeal, appeal to Him for help, how to describe troubles in biblical words, how to praise Him when He answers, and knowing how to do so with the words that He uses it turns out that this is an extreme comfort to all of God's people, and it has been for generations of God's people. The verses I'm covering today, verses 8, 9, and 10, are about salvation, the non-salvation of false gods versus the salvation of the Lord. False worship versus true worship. Just as my last sermon was about fear, everyday fear versus the fear of the Lord, this one is about salvation the false contrasted with the true. In these last two verses of Jonah's psalm, he begins by saying that those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And he ends by saying that salvation is only of the Lord. My translation, the New King James Version, translates the idols in verse 8 as worthless idols. The, Nor the New American Standard, NASB, calls them vain idols. One commentator doing his own translation calls idols empty nothings. Calvin translates the phrase as empty vanities. You get the picture. Calling them worthless means they have no value, that they have no purpose. Calling them vain shows that the idols are futile and useless. Calling them empty nothings means they have no content, they are lacking substance. This, of course, is not entirely true because an idol is made out of wood or metal or gold or silver, and therefore it has substance. It is physical, it is real, it has weight, size, and form. But as an object of worship, it is utterly useless, utterly lacking content. And there are few things that Scripture disparages, that Scripture badmouths as much as it disparages idols. I'd like to look at two passages, Psalm 115, which was read this morning, and Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20. In Psalm 115, which we just heard, the idols of the Gentiles, the objects of worship of those that are not part of God's people, are described for us. First, they're the work of men's hands. We'll get to more about that in a moment. They have mouths, 
but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have feet, but they cannot walk. Talk about worthless. Talk about futile. Idols are pictured as, have, pictured as having all these organs of sense, but they can't use them. They cannot speak truth. They cannot see or hear danger. Since they cannot move, they cannot protect a person from anything. Later in Psalm 115, speaking about the Lord, about Yahweh, the phrase is repeated several times, He is their help and their shield. Idols cannot help anybody. The only way they can shield someone is by their physical substance. If someone, were, if someone was shooting at you, I suppose theoretically, you could use a piece of wood or metal as a block. And if you were cold, you could use a piece of wood as a fire. But otherwise, they're not much help. God is a help and shield, not idols. But the real devastating comment in, from Psalm 115 that we read this morning is verse 8. Those who make them become like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Making or worshiping an idol makes a person like them. You cannot talk. At least you cannot talk sense. You cannot see or hear. You can't understand. All your movements, no matter how frenetic, become meaningless. You can work all day and night to amass great wealth, but that wealth cannot protect you from the vagaries of life on earth, let alone from what happens to us after death. Another thing an idol has that scripture really does not mention is it has a head. An idol has a head, but certainly does not have a brain inside that head. That's also a way that those who worship idols become like them. They become brainless. They become stupid. I'm going to read from Isaiah 44. It's a long passage, but it's, it's almost funny in its irony. Almost funny if it weren't so true. So let me read Isaiah 44, starting at verse 9. Those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that, that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works one in coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks, has no water, and is, in, as, and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He makes one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself, and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image, and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he roasts his meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They do not know nor understand for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. And he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? In this passage, the craftsman is designing and creating an image 
Verse 13 tells us of the planning and skill that are required in the production of this image. But in verse 15 and 16, Isaiah tells us with some of the wood, the craftsman builds a fire that he might bake bread. With another piece of the same wood, he fashions, fashions an idol for worship. Part of it he burns to keep warm. The other part he, he uh, creates an idol and, and worships. How silly is that? In verse 17, the craftsman actually prays that the idol, the piece of wood, will deliver him from trouble. And verse 18 explains what is happening. When you worship an idol, God shuts your eyes. He takes away your understanding. He makes your heart deceived. That is what, that is what a worthless idol is. That is what it does for one who worships it. The person becomes blind, senseless, deceived, and without purpose. So let's go back to Jonah, verse 8 of today's passage. It says that those who worship or even regard idols forsake their own mercy. Mercy is an act of forgiving something, of withholding punishment. People beg for mercy when they are sentenced for a crime they've committed. And children, as we all know, beg for mercy when they've done something wrong and are about to be spanked. And yes, we do believe in spanking, even though we've gotten in some trouble on the school's website about that. We do believe that it doesn't uh, necessarily hurt a child as long as it's not abusive. But we people, all of us, need mercy for the forgiveness of our sin. And worshiping an idol takes away the possibility of God's mercy, the one thing that each and every one of us, every single person on the planet needs. Not only does it make one stupid, not only does it make all of one's efforts futile, not only does it destroy one's understanding, worshiping idols separates a person from God and takes away eternal life. It sends a person to hell. Not only does it destroy this life, but it destroys the life to come. That's a pretty big price tag in my estimation. And this would be a good place to launch into a description of our culture's idols, and there are plenty. Our culture, culture worships its celebrities. It worships political power. It worships pleasure. It worships worse, I'm sorry, it worships work, and conversely, it also worships the weekend for play. What I'd like to do instead, though, is look at the second commandment, Exodus chapter 20. If you'll turn there with me. Exodus 20 is basically the second commandment that forbids making images. So I'm going to read it, starting at verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make an image of anything that's in the heaven, on earth, or in the sea, and you shall not bow down and worship it or serve it. I've often wondered, really, why God forbids images. I've often wondered about this commandment. I guess one easy answer is that God is God, and so he can do what he wants. Um, he, can, he can make rules that he wants and whatsoever pleases him. But when you look at uh, the rest of the law, especially the second table of the law, commandments 5 through 10, you quickly see that God's commands are in keeping with human nature, with our human frame. God's commands not only reflect his good character, they're designed to make us humans more whole. They work to improve our lives. Obeying the commandments is how we truly live. That's why I talk about them so frequently, and I'm sure you all get tired of it. For example, we need the order of hierarchy in our lives, so there is, a, so there is the fifth commandment about honoring parents. We need to be safe, so the sixth commandment forbids murder. Families, it turns out, work best with a mother and a father, and marriages work best when there's fidelity in the marriage. So the seventh commandment against adultery is not just a symbol of how we forsake God, but it is the way that our families stay together. We just need to look at the culture to see the problem with that. And so on. 
But why the second commandment? Why is there a prohibition against images? How does that fit with our human frame? Well, I'm going to try to answer that here. And to give full credit, this idea came to me while I was listening to a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death by a guy named Neil Postman. And he wrote it in 1984. His argument was that our culture was going to pot, and I use was because that was 30 years ago. Actually, it was almost 40 years ago, wasn't it? How did I get so old? Um, our, our culture is going to pot because of the television. And this is from somebody who's clearly not religious, and even so, he mentions the second commandment in the book. Scripture is word-based. The written word can be printed. And once printed, it can be considered. It can be examined for rationality, for logic, for truth versus falsehood. God expressed himself to his creation in the word. While his majesty, his goodness, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature, as Paul says in Romans 1, are revealed in creation, the only way to truly know God is through his revealed word in scripture. Certainly the only way to know his demands and to know the way out of our human predicament of sin is through the scripture. His word, which can be printed out, considered, examined for logic, for rationality, all those things that I mentioned before. God's word in scripture tells us all we need to know for life and godliness. It shows us humans the way out of the quandary of our sin. It tells us for what purpose we are here on earth, to enjoy God and to glorify him forever, as the Catechism says. It even tells us our purpose in raising families, to raise up godly offspring and to have arrows in our quiver. It tells us our purpose in work, that we may provide for our families and have something to share with those who are less fortunate than us. One of the most important things it tells us is that we are made in God's image, each and every one of us, and therefore we have meaning. We are not just a bag of chemicals randomly brought together by zillions of years of impersonal time and chance. No, we are created by God to be like him, and we were planned before the foundation of the world. As I said, all of these things can be read, pondered, examined for truth, and examine to see if they correspond to real life. And they do. Scripture corresponds to real life. It's the only answer to why we are here, what the nature of man is, what is right and wrong, and how we can really know anything. But we no longer live in a word-based culture. We live in an image-based culture. It's interesting to hear Postman describe how television, which gave us images in eight-minute segments, before there was a break for a commercial, has ruined the culture. Remember, that was 1984. Eight minutes is way beyond the attention span of most people this, in our day. We do single images or short videos. The closest most people in our culture get to words is a maximum of two sentences on Twitter. Beyond that, our culture is truly image-based. We even have a saying for it, a picture is worth a thousand words. Except that it isn't, because our media, whether TV, the internet, or our computers and our phones, gives us a constant barrage of images. We never have time to process one image before being presented with the next. Therefore, we never have time to discern the truth being told by that image. We never have time to consider how it might relate to right and wrong. What does scripture say about those that regard worthless idols? <clears throat> they become like them. They become blind. They become deaf. They lack understanding. In short, they become brainless. They become stupid. They cannot evaluate the rationality of anything. They cannot evalu evaluate the rationality of anything because they have such short attention spans. Because they cannot think straight with the constant images presented to them. And because of that, they are unable to understand that A cannot equal non-A. Is it any wonder that our culture is what it is? Is it any wonder a liberal author can get canceled for insisting that a woman is a person that has two X chromosomes? At least she can define woman. Apparently, it takes a law degree to unlearn that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Or is it any wonder that Colorado is on the verge of passing a bill that will allow abortion past the time of birth? Conservative critics will certainly justifiably cry that this is evil, and it most certainly is evil. But when you think about it, it's just the logical progression of allowing abortion. If you can kill a human in utero, what's the big deal of killing it once it's born? These are the consequences of disobeying the second commandment. This is what the constant attention to images gets you. This is what the regard for worthless idols brings. This is the salvation of the world, which of course is non-salvation. This is how one forsakes their own mercy, mercy from God, but as we see with the cancellation of that author, the cancel culture, this is also how one forsakes the mercy of other humans. There is no mercy, none. Zero, zip, nada. Right here would be a good place to launch into a tirade on how to stop being image-based. I'm not going to do that because, first of all, this sermon is already long. And second of all, I have to confess that I'm just as much a product of this image-based culture as the rest of us. But we do need to think about it. And I want you all to think about it. How should we as Christians get beyond the image-based culture? So, let's go back to our text in Jonah. Verse 9 starts with the word, but. There are other places in Scripture where the first word in the sentence is but. And the one that always comes to my mind is the one that we read in our Scripture reading this morning. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God. After describing how sinners were dead in their trespasses, Paul presents a huge contrast. But God, he says. But God saves sinners despite their sin. I once heard a sermon by Martin Lloyd-Jones on those two words, but God. Thankfully, Jonah uses the word but here. Jonah proclaims that he will not serve worthless idols. Rather, he will sacrifice to the Lord. He will pay vows to the Lord. He will use a voice of thanksgiving to the Lord. And the reason is that salvation is of the Lord. Those who regard worthless idols forsake mercy, but salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord from start to finish, and it is of the Lord in several different ways. Let's explore some of them. First, salvation is of the Lord because God ordained that it would be so. Ephesians 1.4, which would have been a good chapter to read for our New Testament reading also, I had multiple choices in that. The one I really wanted was Romans 8, but Dan took that last week. <laughs> Ephesians 1.4 says that God chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Logically, before God can choose individuals to be redeemed in and by Christ, he had to choose that redemption would be purchased by Christ. In addition to that, God chose the method of Christ's execution, as well as the guilty parties that would condemn him to the cross. Acts 4, verses 27 and 28 say, For truly against your Holy Spirit servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand, sorry, I lost my place, to, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined beforehand to be done. God provided for redemption before the foundation of the world to be accomplished through Christ's crucifixion at an exact time and place in history. And he did it from before the foundation of the world. Furthermore, when God provided for the redemption of sinners, he ordained that there should be no other way for that redemption but through Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Salvation is of the Lord first because he ordained it. Besides the orda ordination of redemption, God provided the means. Daniel spoke about this a little bit last week. First, he made the world and all the people in it, and all very good, as it says in Genesis 1. Next, he wrote his law on the hearts of people. At least to a degree, this was lost at the fall, but not entirely. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15 says that Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law. 
Thereby they show that the work of of the law is written on their hearts. As you've heard me say many many times before, God gave us his law to show us how to live, to show us how to best function in accord with his world. God also gave specific commands to Adam in the garden to provide for his good. And when Adam sinned by disobeying God's command, God promised redemption in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. God then provided the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish that redemption via the means already mentioned. Remember, though, that God who made the world also made the tree that became the cross and made the men that would condemn his promised redeemer. Salvation is of the Lord, not just because God ordained it, but because he made the world and provided the means to accomplish salvation. Next, God provided the certainty of salvation and applied it to his people, to the specific individuals within his covenant. As I've mentioned, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Romans 8 in verses 29 and 30 tell us that whom God foreknew, he predestined, and whom he predestined, he called, with a call that the the theologians call an effectual call. Whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, he glorified. If God foreknows you, you will be saved. You will be justified. That is, you'll be made righteous in his sight, and you will be glorified, meaning spending eternity in heaven with God. As Daniel also emphasized last week, Romans 8.31 then asks the question, if God is for us, who can be against us? There is nothing in the universe stronger than God. So if God says you will be justified, there is no one in heaven or on earth that can take that away. And Jesus also promises in John 6 that all people that God gives to him will come to him. And furthermore, he will not lose a single one of those people, but he will raise them up at the last day. To paraphrase Spurgeon, not only are those saved that God chooses, but they cannot be anything but saved. Salvation is of God because he ordained it, because he's provided the means for it, and because he has made it certain. But despite all this, despite all these ways that salvation is of the Lord, There are a bunch of benefits that come with salvation. We could take another sermon to discuss this, and we probably should. Because as important as all of what I've said before is, salvation is beneficial to the child of God. There's a reason that nobody in their right mind would reject it. First, there are the benefits in our relation to God, in his application of salvation to his people. I've already alluded to some of them. God calls us, and this call is effective to save us, to make us believers in Christ's work on the cross on our behalf. Next, God regenerates us. He makes us born again, as Nicodemus is told in John 3.3. 3. Then God grants us faith that we might believe. It is the gift of God, as we read this morning, and Paul tells us that in Ephesians 2. There are many Christians, there may even be some here, who think that their faith in Christ was their own doing, but not according to Scripture, it's not. Sure, a person has to believe, but until God changes your heart, you won't believe. You can't. You're dead in sin. And once you have faith, faith that Christ died for your sins, you will repent of that sin. And once you have faith and repent of sin, God will justify you. This is why works righteousness is so silly. Not a single person that has ever lived, except for the Lord Jesus, of course, has been able to keep God's commands perfectly. So no one can legitimately stand before God and claim that God could declare him as innocent, should declare him as innocent. Only faith in Christ's work will justify a sinner, and even that faith is from God. Then, in this long line, God adopts the new believer, the newly justified sinner, into his family. He adopts us, making us each, making each of us that believe his child, and making us siblings of our brother, Jesus. Our pastor in Spokane, Yost Nixon, used to say that the only way a person gets unlimited access 
to the refrigerator in a home as if they're part of the family. Well, God has given us access to his refrigerator. He makes us part of his family, we who once hated him and all that he stands for. Then, on top of that, God provides for our sanctification, that we might be more holy. He causes us to persevere in all of this by his own power. As Christ said in John 6, I have not lost a single one. Finally, God will glorify us. He will make us sinless again, as Adam was originally, and thereby make us able to stand in his presence. Imagine that. Imagine Imagine being able to stand in the presence of God and not sin, not to think bad thoughts, not to, not to worry about your deeds, but to stand in the presence of God and not sin. That's how Adam was supposed to be originally, but unfortunately he lost it. All of that last section I did from calling to glorification is known to theologians as the Ordo Salutis. It's incredibly good, and obviously for the good of the child of God. And all of it, first to last, is of God. Salvation is of the Lord. But I'm really just getting warmed up. There are still more benefits. I'll try to be brief, but this is also incredible. It's the kind of thing that every believer wants to hear about constantly. The next benefit is that of eternal life. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We've been talking about the benefits of salvation in this life, but this is really the big E. This is the big E on the I chart, as our pastor used to say. As part of salvation, God grants us eternal life. I'm not even going to touch on those benefits, but just imagine being present with God, as I said earlier. As important as the here and now is and the benefits of salvation are in this life, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that if we hope in this life only, we are most to be pitied. But there are benefits in this life. First, salvation means that there's meaning to life. There is meaning to every aspect of life, to history, to economics, to literature, to music, you name it. And there is meaning to our individual lives. Every person ever conceived, I can't say born because of the abortion problem, every person ever conceived is made in the image of God. We are not just some random bag of chemicals, as I said earlier, the product of time and chance. There is a reason each of us is alive. Next, there's purpose for our lives. Our lives have a goal, a telos, as the philosophers say. Our purpose, as the first question in the Shorter Catechism reminds us, is to glorify God and enjoy Him. Among the many ways we glorify God are included doing His will, raising up godly children, becoming more like His Son, Jesus, being part of His kingdom as it advances. And I'll bet each of you can think of many others. But the point is that we have a purpose. We're not just here by random chance, and we are not just existing until we die and somebody puts us in the ground. Next, we are rational. We can know the truth, and the truth will set us free. We can know that we have true knowledge about God because he has left us his word, and his word is truth. Furthermore, as I've said before, only God's word explains the world, and only living according to his word comports, comports with the world. It turns out that life goes better when it's done according to God's according to God's word, when it's done to his glory. And finally, at least for today's message, one of the earthly benefits of salvation is that a good society is produced. It is a safe society. When enough people truly believe the command not to kill, a person can stop worrying about his or her safety. I've heard that a woman could walk down the street in Calvin's Geneva alone at night and be safe. Try that in Chicago. Heck, try that in Leavenworth. And one of the earthly benefits of salvation is a good society that is concerned with true social justice, concern for the poor, for the oppressed, for the widows and the orphans. Those who are truly oppressed, not those with cell phones, 
beamers and nice houses who are supposedly oppressed because they happen to have a different skin color. Not those that are supposedly oppressed because they enjoy flouting their sin against God, but those who are poor, who are truly destitute. Those children being raised, and there are countless of them, in bad circumstances. They are the modern equivalent of orphans. Or women abandoned by their husbands due to sin. Those are the modern equivalent of widows. The Christian church used to provide for these kinds of people with their problems, and they did it because salvation is of the Lord. Well, I've gone a long time and I've said a lot. And only in the last paragraph did I even begin to apply any of this. I'm sure each of you were thinking of specific applications as I was talking about it. It'll make good discussion around the dinner table. The thing I want to leave you with is this. There is a difference in the salvation, which is not salvation at all, of worthless idols, and the true salvation, which is of the Lord. And it doesn't matter whether the idol is made out of a piece of wood or whether it takes the form of green energy like electric cars, solar panels, and windmills, or the countless other idols of our culture. If you wanted to see how bad the salvation of idols is, all you had to do was go to work on the Monday and see how depressed people were after the Chiefs lost the AFC championship game. Or how easily someone like J.K. Rowling gets canceled. Doesn't matter if you agree on 99% of things, Disagree on the current thing, which of course is always changing, and you get canceled. Contrast that with the salvation of the Lord. It is sure. It is necessary. It is eternal. Even if something bad happens to you in this life, and hard providences do come, the true salvation of God gives us the assurance that it is for our good and his glory. Bad things help him. I'm sorry. Bad things happen. Welcome to a fallen world. Sometimes miracles happen, like Jonah getting swallowed by a fish to be saved from drowning and then getting vomited up on the beach. But usually the miracle that happens is not physical, it's spiritual. And that miracle is that God saved us. Amen. If God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus promises that he will not lose one of those given to him. And he promises that he is with us even to the end of the age. Salvation is of the Lord. Yeah. Let's pray. O oh, most holy God, we praise and thank you for our salvation. We thank you that it is sure, that it is to your glory, and we especially thank you that it is to our benefit. We thank you that salvation is only of Jesus Christ, that we might be more conformed to his image. We pray that you would cause us to think on your salvation, to show it to a world that's so deeply in need of it, that you would send your spirit to change the hearts of people, that Christ might get all the glory. And we pray together the prayer Christ taught his disciples singing. <laughs>